<laughs> Very nice. Okay, good. Perfect. All right, so yeah, then we'll keep it in English. Welcome everyone. Um, just want to let you know that we are recording the session. Um, so just good to know, this is the AI Pocket Fika. My name is Eva Josefsson Lindqvist and I'm project manager for the data factory at AI Sweden. And the purpose of the AI Pocket Fika is um, to share some knowledge from um, use cases that have been using the data factory. And today we have invited John who has worked uh, together with Göteborg Film Studios on a very interesting project in the data factory. So John, please go ahead. Yes, uh, yeah, I mean, my name is John and uh, I've been working at the data factory together with the uh, Gothenburg Film Studios in order to um, streamline the deep fake uh, process to uh, to fit well for uh, for professional uh, filmmaking um, so I guess I'll just uh, talk a little bit about first uh, the deep fake uh, software and um, some uh, a little bit about the work I've been doing at the data factory with this and how it has helped us in, in this process. Um, first of all, uh, I started working with it in 2019 or 18, I think, uh, for the uh, short film project Bradham, where we used it um, as a tool to, to uh, to deep fake uh, the main uh, actress in the film. And this was the first time, as far as I know, that it was used in a, in a professional sort of uh, production, um, at least for, as a short film production that would be sent on, on, a, on a cinema screen. And uh, we pretty quickly then noticed that while we could do it fairly well, it, the program lacked some, um, some uh, uh, traits needed for uh, for professional film uh, like resolution, especially in close-ups and so on, was lacking. Um, speed was a bit lacking too, and um, also it didn't really fit with the uh, post-production pipeline that goes on in in, uh, in professional filmmaking, where you have color graders and so on. Um, who wants data in, in specific ways that, that we couldn't provide then. So we had to do quite a lot of compromises and we decided afterwards that we should try to develop this uh, or streamline it rather uh, to fit this process better. And since I'd been working with it a bit then, uh, I got tasked with doing this. And already then we worked together with the data factory. We used their DGX I think one box with a V100 uh, uh, v cards in there. Um, which was pretty quick. And when we actually started working on this development a year or so later, uh, they had upgraded their hardware to these new 800 uh, cards and that we started running on. Um, a lot of the process in the beginning there was to try uh, to train these models and see uh, how performance and so on was affected by these, uh, this better hardware. Uh, where well, we could see quite a, a lot of improvements. Uh, we trained during this film project on the old cards, the model with a resolution of uh, 192 by 192 pixels. And it took about a month to train a model. And uh, doing the same thing on these new cards uh, took only a week. So it was a, a significant improvement um, uh, running on these new, uh, new cards. Uh, I think I'm going to actually go through maybe the software a little bit, just explain how it works and so on. Um, and then go through uh, some of the stuff that we have tried to do with it. Um, so essentially, it's open source software right? it's called DeepFace Lab. You find it on GitHub. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a pipeline of uh, uh, the whole process of, of this DeepFake. I mean, so it's a, a couple of main, three main components, essentially. There's a face detection component, um, uses uh, well, face detection algorithm, a neural network um, called a single shot scale invariant face de detector, uh, which is an anchor based detector, uh, which is adapted to work better for, for small faces than uh, other uh, former anchor detectors. 
Um, and then, uh, of course, also all of these things, it is created in a way that you can easily modify and swap what kind of uh, algorithm and so on you want to use. So if you want to use another kind of facial detect, that's pretty easy to, to put into this pipeline and, and streamline for, for your own use, I guess you could say. Um, after the, the facial detection, there's a face alignment phase where you try to align the face since we're working uh, with a film. The data we put in, essentially we take a, a, a video, let's say we cut it into the frames. So each frame then is an image which are put in as data. And of course, these data needs to be uh, realigned later on to create, create the film again. Uh, and so every frame, every face has to be correctly aligned with the next face and the next frame and so on. So the face alignment is very important. So the face doesn't swap around and, and have different angles and so on. Um, and uh, the software uses as a standard, again, you can change it out if you want, uh, a, a 2D fan uh, landmark algorithm. Um, um, and uh, to, to align the faces. And, uh, after all this is done, uh, facial detection, the facial alignment and so on, you have all your, your uh, landmarks uh, to put into the, to the training algorithm. Uh, it's time to train, basically. There's also an intermediate step that it's sort of optional, but very good to use in these type of things, which is face uh, segmentation, where you want to um, mask out objects, for example, um, like covering the face. It could be, I don't know, a glass or a hand or something. Um, and this, uh, this is a model on its own. So you can actually train um, a facial segmentation algorithm that learns to mask faces correctly. So it essentially cuts out the face uh, in front of the, the uh, object so that the object stays and the face that is predicted later doesn't cover the object, so it looks weird and so on. Um, but yeah, the training may be more importantly or more interesting, perhaps. Um, it is a it is a, an auto encoder uh, with an encoder layer uh, with a um, um, let's see. Uh, it's a with the convolutional layers, so it takes uh, takes the data, the images. Um, and uh, throws it into the encoder, which uh, well, encodes it. The code is then uh, uh, transferred through intermit intermittent, intermittent, like middle layers um, that picks up the code and send it on to the, uh, the decoder later. Uh, that basically puts it out in, in um, uh, to, uh, to be uh, composed, like put together again. Um, and um, there are two different architectures that can be used. Uh, there is one where there is a single encoder for both uh, the pair of faces. So yeah, it's, it's essentially two faces, right, that you need. So you need the source face, which is the, uh, let's say, the, the face you want to cut out, <laughs> and then the destination face, which is the face where you want to interpolate the, the cutout face or, or predict the cutout face. Um, so they, they use the same encoder. And then in, in one of the architectures called the uh, DF architecture, uh, it is sent on to one intermediate layer. And then each source and destination phase has a separate decoder uh, to predict uh, the face. In the other, uh, architecture, there is again a single encoder um, with a convolutional 2D layer that sends the information to two intermittent uh, uh, layers, uh, which then um, generalize representations of the faces. Um, so there's one representation for the source face and two representations uh, for the destination face. Uh, and these latent codes that are sent over uh, to the uh, um, decoder where they are concatenated um, uh, and, and spat out, whatever you want to say. Um, yeah. 
And then um, as for the last part, uh, the last component in this whole pipeline is the conversion. Um, and uh, it's another neural networks and it sends then um, the, uh, the input that has come out from the training decoder. <clears throat> Uh, and then it sends it through this network. Uh, I'm not too uh, in depth into how that one is working. Actually, I haven't looked at it. Um, but in the end, at least, you get a prediction of the source phase on top of the features of the destination phase. Um, so you could say that yeah, it paints uh, a painting of, of these pixels on top of each image, then, and then they are put together. Uh, into uh, into a, a film again or a, a clip or something like that, um, and there are of course uh, there are a lot of sort of um, optional uh, parameters you can turn on to you can you can focus uh, the training by focusing the weights uh, to to train more around the eyes areas and so on uh, a lot of these different uh, features. Um, I haven't looked specifically at any of those, has, hasn't been part of the work we have been doing, so I can't uh, speak any more in depth about those things. Um, so let's move on to maybe more of the work that we have been doing then. Uh, and for us, it was important to streamline this. The, the whole process is, is already really good. Uh, so it was more to fix and tinker here and there to, to uh, make it fit well with this uh, professional uh, film post-production. Uh, and uh, one of the main issues was then the, uh, the images sent in um, and spat out. Uh, there was some, they're, they're pretty um, uh, compressed and so on in order to, uh, to efficiently handle them. Like the network cannot train on, on too high quality images anyway, or, or you don't get anything out of it. It just takes longer time, takes more memory. And it cannot learn all these uh, nuances in a phase. Um, so it was compressed along the way a lot. And uh, what comes out is not very optimal. For, for example, a color grader needs a lot of um, colors and so on in, in the image color information that is lost during this compression. Um, so one, one uh, of our tasks was to fix that. Um, to, to keep as much information in the image after it has gone through the whole process as possible. Um, then there was also a problem with uh, speed. Um, we wanted to, to uh, be able to train this as quick as possible, which can be important, especially if we want to sell this as like a product. Uh, and um, uh, a main issue then was the parallelization of the whole thing uh, over the different uh, GPUs, and uh, we encountered quite some problems in that uh, department. Uh, it is parallelizable uh, to uh, theoretically uh, as as many cards as you need, as long as you have uh, sufficient batch size. So it parallelizes the data. It's it's, uh, it's, it's the batches that sent in, so the images that gets um, divided up among the different cards. Um, well, we encountered some problems where, uh, for some reason, after going up to a certain amount of cards, um, we got a uh, memory issues, like the, the first GPU where a lot of the uh, optimization information was stored, went out of memory, even though it had worked with lesser cards. So something going on there, which is currently a work in progress actually to fix that. Um, but we can run parallel up on, up to six cards, I think, but then it goes goes wrong. Um, we also had the resolution problem, uh, which is again a, a bit of a memory issue and a speed issue. Uh, when you have a, a a large face, you want uh, you want the resolution to be as high as possible, so it's not blurry. When you you have a close up shot, for example, right now it can train up to six hundred by six hundred pixels, and then it's the face. Yeah, yeah, that gets uh, trained then, that is that amount of pixels. So if you have a, a screen, a, a film clip, you maybe have a full HD or something, so you have 1,024 pixels by, I don't know, 920, whatever it is. 
then this 600 by 600 pixel space that you can train uh, is still a, a pretty large part of the screen. So we can do it up until a, a pretty um, pretty big close-ups, you could say. Uh, but full, very close-up pictures are, are still an, an issue, uh, not only in the resolution department, but also in the fact that it's hard for the network to train it as, as detailed as you might want uh, in that kind of um, um, close-up. So that certain parts that would move and so on in a in a real phase, uh, in such a close up, maybe are not uh, taken into account, and the, the pixels are more blurred together. I guess you could say. And these are also still work in progress uh, to, uh, to sort of try to to fix that and make it better. Um. Yeah, I think uh, that's what I can think of right now. Uh, in terms of what we've been doing and so on. Um, I guess questions maybe would help me out, perhaps. That's a good idea. Do we have any questions? I can also let you know that we do have um, the producer with us, Paul. You're also on the call. So if there are any questions on, on that end, that's okay as well. Hi, yeah, I have a question. Yes, please, Olaf. Uh, Johan. <laughs> No, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm not curious sorry. if you have any like images of like where it failed that you could share. Wait, sorry again. Do you have any like uh, examples of like what it looked like when it failed? Uh, that I can share here. You mean? Yeah. Let's see if I have something. I'm not sure actually. While you look at that, I, I have put the link um, to the film that is on SVT Play. If you want to have a look, it's. Uh, yeah. short film of 20 minutes so there at least you see the final results yeah this is of course uh, we have done a lot as, as much as we can to to hide as much as we can of the problematic yeah, of but, uh, for example there were some uh, very close-up images uh, that we were not able to use uh, where it's essentially the face fully covers the screen and you can see that it's extremely uh, blurry like you can see um and the pixel values and so on. This is with an older version though. So we could only train in a 192 by 192 pixel then compared to 600 by 600 now. Um, but imagine, you know, you have a you have some sort of uh, image you take from, uh, from just Googling an image and then you zoom in on it and you can really see the pixels uh, fairly good when you zoom in. Um, something like that, uh, okay. if, you, if you want to imagine. How it might look. And then we have Olaf has raised a hand. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, did you manually retouch some of the part, some parts of the movie? Um, to yeah. Uh, if we did uh, like add effects and so on afterwards. Or... Yeah, or if there's like a few filler cases that the model couldn't handle, and you oh, went um, in to kind of manually fix them. Not really, actually. It could handle almost. Everything. You, there were some stuff that we couldn't take because um, the face was too covered. Like uh, one uh, issue is that if if you if the facial detection fails, like you cannot find a face at all, uh, then this image will not be trainable. So um, detecting the faces is really uh, like mandatory in order to be able to train that particular frame and. With a film, if certain, uh, in, in one frame, a face suddenly disappears and then it comes back the next, notice that immediately. Um, unless it's very quick, like a person walking out of screen, it doesn't matter if, uh, if the face disappears here, you, you barely see it, for example. But uh, there were some cases where we had half a face, for example, uh, it couldn't detect the face. Uh, and uh, in, in that, those cases we couldn't train that frame and we couldn't use it. There are all the cases, which is also a major issue, I'd say, where uh, if you have an object covering the face, uh, it can still detect the face, but it cannot see fully behind the object. So the segmentation algorithm that I spoke of before can solve masking out this object. That means you train the face. If you don't have segmentation, the face will still be 
on top of the object, a little bit more blurry and so on, but it will still be able to predict it. The segmentation and masks out that part of the prediction. So the hand is just here and the, the prediction is behind. However, when something comes up at this, the facial recognition again, tries to detect the face, doesn't know how the face looks here and cannot infer uh, good enough uh, how a face would look behind an object. So if you think of the landmarks, which is like, you can think of like green dots going around here, detecting my face. Then when it comes around the object, it might go out and become like wobbly a little bit like that. So it doesn't have the knowledge of how a face would look like behind an object and it tries to sort of predict it, but it usually does it very badly. Um, and what happens then is that on these frames, even though you mask out the object, you can see some vibrations here and there around the face, which can be pretty detectable. It depends if you train the algorithm more, you can get around that perhaps, but it's, it's not uh, certain. So uh, a big part of it is actually the facial um, detection that could be improved. Okay. Yeah. Well, I have a, a question to Paul was it the producer. Um, Go ahead. So how do you plan uh, for a movie like this when you're not entirely certain how well the face swapping will work ahead of time? I'm not sure. If Paul, are you? Now you're unmuted, let's see. Or no? Yep, still mute. John, do you know any of those? Uh, do I know how? I don't I know. I'm not sure uh, I can speak for, for Paul there, really. Um, I guess a lot of bravery. <laughs> <laughs> I guess so. Let's like, see. did you try it for hand? Like, did you have any indication that it would work? Uh, no, no, we were just, we just uh, threw ourselves into it and hoped that uh, we could do the best. We did some, I mean, initial testing, but um, it, was, it was really just a learning uh, experience on the journey when we made the first, the first film there. And, uh, a couple of different tries to see what didn't work out, what worked out. I hadn't looked anything into the code or so on at that stage uh, or how it was built. So it was uh, yeah, just continuous uh, uh, learning. And we had about six months or so to, to finish it off. So it was, uh, um, it was a lot of work during that time. Okay, any, any more questions for John? Uh, yeah, I have one more. Yes, please. Uh, so when, when I train um, neural network models, um, I often train them on single images. And then if you run it on a video, the output is flickering quite a lot. Uh, but in this movie that you created, I don't think I saw that flickering at all, and I looked for it. And so I, I thought that that was quite amazing. Uh, you spoke a little bit about the face alignment step and it's mm. like, uh, but even so after that, you put it into this auto encoder to create this image, I, uh, I understood it as. But can you talk a little bit about like, does it flicker and I just didn't notice it or like how um, do you avoid the flicker? It depends. It doesn't really flicker that, I mean, in the beginning, it will be definitely some flicker, uh, but it's usually, uh, you can train it away. If you do train it on, on just one image and so on, we send in the whole, uh, the whole uh, image library, I guess you could say, as training images uh, in, in coming in as many batches into the, into the algorithm. Uh, so every image uh, will get training time, um, which I think helps uh, quite a lot with that. If you just train on a couple of images and then try to apply that to something, even the same face, 
but it hasn't seen it before, then it will be uh, severely uh, uh, worse quality. Um, so, uh, so it really benefits from training on all of them, all the, the uh, images. I think that can help with the flickering. You could also notice there were some uh, cases in the, in the film here where there are some scenes that are much longer. Uh, and um, these images, of course, then came into the, as in the batches more often. Uh, not the same particular frame, but a frame that was very much alike other frames in that particular uh, uh, clip. Uh, and you could notice that the algorithm could handle those much better uh, in later stages because it has simply seen more of those types of images with the same light uh, and so on. Uh, so so the, the quantity of, of images you use to train is, is definitely important, um, that it sees as much as possible of them, especially then when it comes to the, the destination, so the, the actual person who will get their face or who will get the face uh, predicted onto them. Um, they need to, to have every frame uh, sent in to, to training to guarantee a, a good results. Okay, makes sense, I guess. All right. We're already at uh, 3.30, so I want to say thank you so much, John, and thank you to everyone listening in. Um, great. We'll see if we have another uh, Fika in, in two weeks. Uh, we'll post it on AI Sweden's website, if so. Uh, but thank you so much, and have a really nice weekend. And now you do have um, the film session for tonight saved uh, with the one film to watch, at least. So happy Friday, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.